that, let's talk. Uh, let's get into uh, what you you've you've said a few things. I, I you know what? Where do you want to go with this? Because you are so phenomenal. Yeah. I can try and I, direct something, but well, I mean, you, you run circles around You're me. You're being so too kind like, now. Uh, being too kind. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know about that, but I think maybe we should just left a follow up from your last roundup. I think with Lalo and on the uh, TSA emergency yes. amendment to the directive, mm-hmm. and you know, I could share. I have some information that I could share with you after if you want to post it, just like a, a slide that really kind of tells some of the talking points. But I think you know, as everyone's aware, and since your last podcast, I will kind of tag off of that Mm -hmm. TSA CBP amendment security directive, which is 14, sorry, 1544-24-02. You made a comment that something must have happened. Something did happen. So there was some type of event that took place that that was identified through CAS, I would imagine, ACAS, I would imagine, um, and which drove these emergency changes, some type of explosive material, obviously affecting the supply chain and where it came from. Also, just to mention, Canada is also following the same suit. So if anyone's shipping into Canada, you might want to check it because they're mirroring the same emergency amendments. It's just astronomical what's going on. Anyway, that said, here's where I will say that I don't understand why customs didn't require it. But um, when these, the minimum, there's containers that come in and they're loaded with these small e-commerce type shipments and, you know, from Shane, from Timu or somebody else or whoever else. And they're coming in with a tractor trailer full of these things and all that. And they're trying to present it to customs to say, okay, here's a section 321 manifest or a, and customs is going, well, we want to see some of this. Well, I don't know where, you know, I can't I just pop the doors here. I'll block everything. See, to me, that's where I'm like, wait a minute. You guys need to require a scenario here that if you're going to clear it as a de minimis, there ought to be reimbursables there for customs to deal with it. There ought to be electronic manifest requirements so that it's transmitted before arrival. And thirdly, is that the facilities need to be there to where, you know, all right, you're going to clear it through over here, whatever, and you get through and, and require that every piece be accounted for all that electronically scanned, sorted, whatever. It's like the run that we were dealing with. We were being that good corporate citizens. We were having to pay as an express carrier, the reimbursables, all that. The point being now it's like they're trying to clear using old conventional ways to say, well, you know, here's a consolidation, if you will, or something, yeah. and it just do it as a manifest. It's not that you're talking tens of thousands of shipments. It's unrealistic. So to me, I'm like, wait a minute, if you're going to utilize that and do that, put limits over it or whatever, so that I, you know, I can process maybe, you know, 15, 20 shipments you walk up, there it is. That's fine. But if you get over there, it's like, look, I need a facility in it and, and have customers yeah. require that. That to me yeah. is where the industry needs to go. But I think just recently, I think it was last Friday, uh, the Biden Harris announced that they are looking for a, to publish a notice of proposed rulemaking. And, you know, basically, you know, the Glock switches, the pill presses, the fentanyl, and, and those that are abusing from a textile standpoint, uh, footwear, which you mentioned Sheen before, Timu, Sheen, those are. Ali, Alibaba, there's a few others, but and that that it's impacting the American market. I think for that one, it's to me for the textile, footwear, electronics. That's a cultural shift, and that's a you and me as a purchaser. What do we know about any of this? How are we edu- educating those folks that are sitting behind a computer, getting on Amazon and making their order, or you know, going on Timu and placing you know an order for ten shirts. Because it's fifty dollars, so I'm going to buy ten shirts, and you know you can go down the whole other road when it comes to you know um, sustainability. That's a whole other conversation for the younger generation that really is focused on that. This is kind of counterproductive, but um, I think when we look at when we look at all of the e-commerce coming in, I think. I think Coax said it was currently last year was at four billion, and we're already at four billion for this year. So it's just exploding. And I th- I want to say it was like a hundred and ninety thousand back for 
prior to COVID. So, you know, and don't quote me on the numbers because I'm just doing that off the top of my head. Uh, it's it's private sector and, and and government working together on some issues and and whatnot. So it's a, it's a very good thing. But in that, you don't need to be heavily involved in government regulatory affairs. You can do it through your trade associations. You mentioned yes. the manufacturers. There's the footwear. There's the textile industries. There's all these different things that are going on. I just would just s- suggest that it's one of the takeaways here. There's a lot of things going on that affects the security of cargo coming into the country. If you're buying goods and your freight forwarder is moving it through uh, cargo airlines or whatever, you know, you need to work with them because your supply chain is going to be disrupted if that that carrier is not transmitting information timely and, uh, and all of that. Again, the issue here is you want to be the good corporate citizen, cross the T's and dot the I's so that your information on your shipments are transmitted, processed, are accurate, and it gets them out of the way so that the uh, government agencies involved can apply their expertise on the bad stuff. So. Yeah. And if I could just add two more points, yeah. too. If if you don't have a global trade management system, per se, processes, procedures, validations, self-audits, external audits, if you need, you need to build that into your business, whatever business that is. It doesn't matter if you're a broker, a freight forwarder, a carrier. Those are key, key components to success. If you don't have a process or a plan, you know, ignorance is not bliss. I get it. And it's like ignorance is, is no excuse for uh, non-compliance periods. So. Yeah. And have a compliance person, right? And if you if you can't train somebody, have somebody that's virtual working for you as a fracturary or, or something along those lines. That's what I would right. recommend. Right. 